I always turn these lights off because it feels like I'm being questioned or something and they have the spotlight on me. Uh, let's pick up where we left off last time. As you recall, we were talking about forms, which, as you know, are a way for the client to give information to the server that the server can use in doing its job. Remember, forms are used typically with server-side scripting. And server-side scripting is where you don't have finished HTML web pages out there. Instead, you have programs whose job it is, is to write HTML pages. Um, so they take data from a variety of sources, databases, other places, but especially from the form that the user enters in. At least that's what's most relevant to us today. Here's an example of one about the log in the Canvas, right? The server-side script in Canvas needs to know who is logging on, right? So it shows me the right classes. So it asks me who I am in the form of asking me for a user ID and password. That's the form. A couple of text boxes and a submit button. So let's say I type in something that is nonsense. All right. I send that to the server. Server thinks about it, looks that up in the database. and decides, hey, that's not right. And it gives me a response that says, hey, you didn't enter in the correct information. Try logging in again. So I put in the right information this time. I click the button. The server scribe script sees that and says, OK, this is the right person. This is a, a legit person. Let's go to the database and pull up all the classes that he's involved in. So it brings it up, and it forms this page for me. So if you were to log into Canvas, the exact same thing would happen to you. And when you entered in the right information, the difference would be is it would take your user ID and find a different set of classes that you're enrolled in, not the same classes that I'm enrolled in. And what's more, you're not the instructor in those classes, at least probably not. All right. So it will give you different permissions to do different things. You, can, you can't enter grades, for example, and so on. All right. So that's the whole idea of server-side scripting. And one of the ways, most important ways, that the client can pass the information to the server is via that form. So we went over and saw how we could submit form data from our client to the Google search script and have it do a search and return the results. And then we saw one where we were just uh, entering data and styling the data and so on. So let's pick up with that example. Yeah, you can say that again. OK. Hmm. OK. I call it search two and submit one, submit two. OK. That's right. I didn't think these were the right examples for a second, but they are. So um, search one, we have very simple form. The action is the script on the other end 
that is going to process the data. In this case, it's Google search, so we link to that. The method get means that the information is going to be passed on the query string, so it's going to be visible in the address bar. Type text means it's going to be a text box. Name equals Q. That's the name that's going to be on the query string. Data on the query string is done in pairs. There's the name of the field, an equal sign, and then the value of the field. So if I say Q for the name of the text box, if I submit HTML, it's going to say Q equals HTML. So all the data on the query string looks like that. And the server can pluck off the appropriate fields, and you're good to go. Now, I did a little, I looked at the Google search results and sort of figured this out. So it wasn't hard to figure out. This is the URL you submit to, and the search field needs to be called Q. Normally, if you're doing this, you're writing both the client-side HTML and the server-side code, so you'll know what to call these things. All right? You'll know what script you want to submit to, and you know what everything needs to be called. If not you personally, then someone from your team will do that. And so you'll communicate and find out what that is. So just to review this one, we go in, we type this in. It submits to the server. Search, question mark, Q equals blah, 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 HTML, and we get our search results. All right. That was our first example. Our second example, we are exploring some of the other ways of sending data, uh, or, or entering data, I should say, rather than a text box. Because a text box is good when you have a single line of freeform text. In other words, if you are registering for a, re a website, and there's a place for a name, you can't pick a person's name from a drop down, right? That's ridiculous. So you have you have to freeform type it in. And it's going to be just one single line. All right? Age range, though, is something that I don't want the user to type in, necessarily, because I want some consistency. Uh, one person, if I typed in age range, one person is liable to type in 20s. I'm in my 20s. Another person is liable to type in, I'm old. Another person is liable to type in, I'm between 18 and 75 years old. You know, you know what I mean? It's like you, you're not going to get any kind of consistency if you allow for a free form entry there. So especially when you're connecting this to a database, which you often do, you want to control what the answers are. So in this case, I gave just a list of options. First of all, I sort of have the dummy option on top. That's to prevent people from not looking at this and just hitting submit. We can later on, we can put JavaScript in there to evaluate and make sure they pick something. But I've defined some ranges, age ranges, 0 to 18, 19 through 35, 36 through 60, 60 plus. So you pick one of these, and you click Submit, and it shows you that I picked an age range of number 3. All right, let's look a little closer how it determined that. For each age range, I have a option tag. Between the option tag is the value that the user is going to see. So that's what makes sense to the user. All right, 0 to 18. You know what that means. The value is what the script sees. And this might tie to the values in a database. Maybe that's how I'm storing it in the database. So value is what the script sees. Between the option tag is what the user sees. Now in this case, I'm submitting to the script that uh, a textbook publisher provides. Uh, I use this textbook in another class, and I, I thought it would just be good to use this, this tool here, where all we do is we just see a listing of what, uh, of what is typed in. So whatever we type in, when we click Submit, we see that. And if you notice that up in the 
query string, since I press button 2, I see btn submit 2 equals submit 2. Whereas if I submitted, or if I clicked button 1, it would say button 1. That way you can tell which button is pressed. And depending on the server side script, that can be important to know that this button is pressed. Again, think of Amazon where you can edit uh, an order and you can either change the line item. So instead of two, two of an item, you can say, I want three of an item. Or you can say, nah, I want to delete the item. All right? So there could be two buttons there, one to update the item, one to delete the button. All right? Questions at this point? So let's pick up with some of the other things. Uh, it is possible to make a drop down allow people to select more than one value in a drop down. But that is sort of rare. Typically, people use drop downs to just select a single value. So that's the only example I'm going to show. The next thing I'm going to show you is radio buttons. And radio buttons are real similar to drop downs in the sense that they allow the user to choose between uh, a list of items. So pretty much, again, with the small exception that drop downs can be configured to allow multiple selections, all right? Uh, how do you do that? Good question. Let me Google it. You just say multiple. All right, then they can pick more than one. So here there's a drop down and you can pick more than one. All right. So also notice that because it's multiple, it, is, it shows all of them. It doesn't just show one. So sometimes that's valuable that you can, you can do that. But for the most part, you're going to use drop downs to select a single value. And radio buttons are the same way. So let's put in a set of radio buttons for um, what would be good to select. Um, favorite sport. I'm going to just give maybe three sports. I don't want to be typing all day. I'm going to create a label for the first one. And again, remember the label is for accessibility because People that can see can associate text with a form control visually. Whereas people that cannot see rely on a screen reader to help them to match up values of a text box or a drop down or whatever in the label. Now this is going to be a little different than before. Let me finish typing this in, and I'll go put two more here.
let's take a look and see all the things that are going on here. First thing you notice is that all of these radio buttons have the same name. All right? That's different than before. All right? Before, if we had multiple uh, text boxes here, it would give each text box its own name. All right? So if we had an address here, or email address, it would have its own name. The fact that they all have the same name makes them work like radio buttons. And what do I mean by that? I mean that when you pick one, it unselects all the rest of them. Okay, that's what I mean by a radio button. Okay, uh, if I didn't give them different names, then I would be able to pick each one individually, and it wouldn't really work. So you give them all the same names. They do, however, have their own ID. All right, because remember, an ID has to be unique on a page. So I can't have things that have the same ID. All right, I'm not allowed to. So each radio button has its own ID, and that's what the label uses to connect the text with the radio button. The type is radio. And finally, the value is what we are going to send to the server if that one is selected. So in other words, if I save this, and we look at it. All right. This is kind of arranged a little bit goofy. But it really doesn't matter how it's physically arranged. The fact that we've all given them the same name makes them work this way. So if I select football, baseball gets unselected. If I select hockey, the other two get unselected. I'm going to go and make a little change here. I'm going to put each of these in its own LI. That way these are spread vertically down the page and we don't run into the difficulty of taking up too much space. Someone pushing a cart down the hall? Yeah. How, did, how come it took so long, though? I mean, it was like, normally when, it, when someone pushes a long cart, it's like you hear it, you hear it, you hear it, and then it fades away. That stayed loud for, it, I swear it felt like five minutes. It was probably 30 seconds or 10 seconds even, but, you know, anyhow. Sort of. Actually, actually, I'm going to do this. Yeah, they are. Let's do this. There we go. Favorite sport. All right. Okay, and then they work as a radio button. And when we click Submit To, whatever radio button we select gets sent over to the server. So in other words, age range or favorite sport could both be done as a radio button or a drop down. 
it's largely going to be how much space you have on the screen or how you want the form to look. So it doesn't really matter what that is. All right? Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is a checkbox. All right? A checkbox is a single yes or no question. All right? A single yes or no question. And checkbox are not related the way that radio buttons are. So, Say type equals checkbox, ID equals CB terms. The name equals CB terms. And the value equals yes. And this is the question you see on a lot of web pages. Do you, have you read our terms? All right. It's either yes or no. And it doesn't really depend on any other one. So if we create a second checkbox here for add to mailing list, those two will work independently. <laughs> exactly. I said, do you? I don't know what you mean. Uh, no. You definitely don't want the terms and conditions one check by default, right? Because that would sort of defeat the purpose. Then people could not read it and do it. The other one, I guess it depends on your level of ethics. If you want to trick people into joining your mailing list, then you default as a check. We haven't talked about how to default this yet. Okay. All right. So right now, it's defaulted to unchecked. And, oops, yeah. And notice that these two work independently. I can have both of them unchecked. I can have one checked and the other. So checkboxes work independently. No. The value equals yes means that's the value that will be sent to the server if it's checked. So I click submit, and the value is that. I could make that anything I wanted to, as long as the server is expecting it. Now, if I want to make it defaulted, let's say I want to trick people into signing up for my mailing list, then I will say checked. And then when you load it up, it's automatically checked. I don't like to just put an attribute like that, even though it's legal in HTML. So I would say checked equals checked. Because I'm used to all attributes having a name and a value. All right, and that will default it to being checked. All right, what's next? 
a text area is next. A text area is a place to put comments or multiple lines of text. So this form doesn't really make sense. I've just sort of been adding stuff. But, you know, delivery instructions if you're ordering a pizza. All right, there you go. And you can use CSS to make that bigger or smaller or whatever. Let's use our CSS to make it bigger than that. So I could go something like text area. Height, 400 pixels with 200 pixels or something. There's a big space then for comments. So we can type in anything we want. We're actually unlimited. If there is a limit, you have to validate that via CSS typically, uh, I'm sorry, JavaScript typically. And if we submit that, we get all the stuff sent over there. All right. There is a type for password, which as you might imagine doesn't echo the what's typed into the text field. So, we do this, we type something in the password, it's not echoed. Now, if I submit it, notice it gets sent on the query string. All right, so that might be not a good situation to use the get. And we might use a post instead on the form. Because the post is not visible on the screen. It's not visible in there. It will get sent to the server, and the server can do something with it. But um, it's not. Um, it's not going to be visible as part of the URL. Now, 
There is one other thing that I think I talked about, and it's a reset button, but I don't like reset buttons. All right, I don't like reset buttons because you can accidentally click them. How do you search for courses here? Does anyone know how you search for courses? Uh, let's see. Course schedule. Let's see. Select a term, frame, select a department, CISS. This used to have a huge problem with that. Yeah. I think they revised it. Never mind. There used to be a big place where you could enter all this search criteria and there was a reset button right next to the submit. And a lot of students told me that they would not be paying too close attention and hit the reset button and it would clear out the data. So I don't like reset buttons, um, so we won't talk about them too much. This is about, this is about um, all the controls, form controls that were in HTML prior to HTML5, okay? There's one other thing that I want to talk about, and that is called a field set. A field set is where you can group form controls together and sort of like make a little mini subforms inside of it. So I'm going to put I'm going to create two, two field sets here, one for personal information and one for preferences. So around this top thing, I'm going to put a field set. And underneath the field set, you can put a legend. So what I'm doing essentially is I'm grouping the form fields together. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm grouping the related form fields together. All right, into sections. Now it gets a little confusing when there's a border on the uh, whole form. So I'm going to get rid of that border. Now you can see that there are two sections to that. It doesn't have anything to do with them being in the sections. It has them to do with it has to do with the names that you give them. So let's look at the code here uh, for this. All these radio buttons have the name of RB Sport. So if I had a different radio button, 
let's copy this. Favorite style of music. What's going to make these behave as a different radio button is the fact I'm going to give all these a different name. So all of these will be called RB Music. And all the sport ones will be called, have a name of RB Sport. So that will make them behave as separate radio buttons. So the ones that have a, the same name are grouped together. Typing. So now we review this. These radio buttons work independently. So these three work as a unit, and these three work as a unit. But it doesn't have anything to do with what field set they're in. It has to do with the fact that um, they are um, they have the same name. Now I can I can style each field set differently if I want to. background, uh, let's make it a light gray, give it a border, three pixel solid black, and let's make the legend a little bit bigger, so I'll say font size 1.4 M. 1.4 M means 1.4 times as big as it normally should be, as normal text. So that makes it look like that. Okay, questions about this. Field sets are good for accessibility because it helps sort of allow people to put things in context. For example, if you had a, sh a shipping address and billing address, all right, a lot of times when you place an order, the bill goes to maybe corporate headquarters, but the shipping goes to a branch office, for example. But if you look at the screen, it might just say address, in which case you don't know if you're accessing this via a screen reader, is that shipping or billing address. By putting it in a field set for shipping or billing, it helps people understand that. All right, now, with HTML5, there's a whole slew of new form controls that you can use. But there's a catch, right? There's always a catch. And the catch is that some browsers don't support them. So they're good, but you can't count on everyone having these form controls, which means that you might have to write JavaScript to validate these controls just like you used to in the old days. But for people that do have a browser that supports these, it makes for a better experience. And the good news is, is these do what's called graceful degradation. In other words, if you don't have a browser up to date to handle these, it doesn't completely break it. It treats all these new controls like text boxes. Because if it doesn't know, if the browser doesn't know what kind of thing a 
input tag is, if you use one of the new input tags uh, and the browser doesn't know it, it treats it like a text box. So let's look for HTML5 form controls and we'll see some cool stuff here. Now here's the basic ones that we saw already. Here's the basic ones. Here's the HTML5 ones. Here's the good one. There's one for color. So when might you use this? When do you want to know what someone's favorite color is? I don't know, a dating app maybe, but probably more important than this. What if you allowed someone to customize their CSS? You might want to know what color scheme they want to use. So when you click on this, when you use input type equals color, you can put in your favorite color by using this color picker. So if I click on that, I can go and say, yeah, I don't like that. I like maybe that shade of green instead. And when you click submit, it sends that code to the server. It's pretty cool. However, it doesn't work in all browsers. Let's see what happens when we try to pull this up in Internet Explorer. We just get a plain ordinary text box. So, it doesn't work as good, but at least it doesn't break. And if you put in if the user put in, it would work, and it would send it to the server. Another example of that is, maybe a better example of that is, there's a date type. Whereas, you can pick the date. And you pick the drop down, it gives you a date picker. And you hit submit. Now notice I can't put in something invalid here. I'm going to try to type in 33. It won't let me type in 33. All right. Now, when you view this on a browser that doesn't support it, It's just an ordinary text box that you can type anything in, all right? Which means that you'd have to use JavaScript, just like you did in the old days to validate that. Now, just because some browser doesn't support it, though, doesn't mean that you're not going to use this, right? Because for the people that do use it, it gives them a better experience. It's just that you have to take into account that some browsers won't support it and write some JavaScript to validate it. Let's look at some of these other ones besides date and color. Oh, you can put a minimum or maximum to enter a date before or after a certain date and time. If you want a date and time, input type date time. Email. So if I try to put in some garbage here, it tells me right off the bat, hey, that's not a valid email. Whereas if I do put in something that matches the form of an email, it tells me it's OK. Now, it's not validating that it's a legal email address. It's just validating that you've matched the form for a proper email address. All right, it's important to recognize. Yeah. 
because they don't want someone like, you know, uh, you know, they, they don't want someone fraudulently signing up someone else for a, a site. All right, they want to know who the email went to. Have type file, which will allow the upload of a file, month, number, and so on. Input type range is pretty cool. Instead of typing in a number, you can scroll back and forth and give a value that way. Search, telephone number, time, URL, week, and so on. So there's a lot of specialized inputs in HTML5 that when you're doing a form, you should at least take a look at them and see if any of those can be useful in your particular situation. Again, for browsers that don't support them, they revert to just a plain old text box, which isn't horrible because at least it doesn't break and you can always write JavaScript validation to make sure that that is correct. All right, any questions? All right, that's all I had for today. Next week we're going to start tables. Um, we'll see you up in lab.